Well, we know the story of Noah and the ark, don't we? The Lord said to Noah, there's going to be a... They know it. Get those children out of the... Muddy, muddy. And I'm not going to make you sing the song. You should give me a little star. We are not singing Arky Arky in worship today, okay? But it's definitely a popular nursery theme, right? How many of you have seen a nursery with Noah's Ark? How many of you have ever had a nursery with Noah's Ark? Okay, lots of people. The one we have here at Grace has a Noah's Ark theme. And we think it's so sweet and so cute. And, and we like how the animals went on the boat in twos. And, and we love snickering that when we sing, they came up by threesy threesies, uh, elephants and chimpanzees. We think that's really funny. But you know, I guess the gestation period in that day was a little shorter for rhinoceroses. I don't think they came out by threes after... 40 days of rain and then some days of drying out the land. But, but have you ever really read the whole story? I mean, it's a pretty unsettling story if you read it. In fact, it's a very dark and terrifying story. I mean, floods are not cute little events. It's kind of ironic that the flood story comes today in the lectionary because today or actually tonight at 2.30 in the morning, four years ago at 2.30 in the morning, I received a phone call from my next door neighbor saying, Nancy, water's coming in our house. I said, no, it isn't. She goes, no, we're being flooded out. The police are outside evacuating the neighborhood. I said, no, they aren't. And I went downstairs and I opened my front door and water came rushing in around my ankles and I looked around and it's coming in from all sides on the foundation of my house. And before I know it, we had six inches of water in our house. Um, 13 houses on my street flooded and our loop, a lot of you know our loop, it became a raging river. We stood on the balcony and watched cars float by. Uh, we watched a trailer with a boat on it float by. Um, a week later we took dead fish out of our swimming pool. It flooded from both sides of the creek. It was one raging river and it was a completely overwhelming dark horrifying experience. Now, nobody on our street died, so it wasn't that tragic. And we all recovered, and, and after months, we all had remodeled homes, although nobody put down carpet in their house again. Um, in fact, on the one-year anniversary, we had a parade of homes so we could show each other what we did. But it was a very hard, challenging time. Although I've told my children they should get down on their knees and thank God that that flood happened because we took away trailer load after trailer load after, and I'm talking roofing trailer load after trailer load after trailer load after trailer load of wet, muddy stuff. You know what that means? One day my children will not have to go through that stuff. Yeah. But did God send that flood to teach us something? I mean, if God flooded the whole earth for a reason, is that why floods happen? Do you really want to say that to the people who experience a tsunami? Did God send it to them to teach them something? And what about all the death that came from the great flood? I mean, God wiped out all of humanity except for Noah and his family. Now, I don't know about for you, but it raises all kinds of thorny theological questions. I mean, like, how can we trust a God who chooses to destroy all of humanity except for one family? Does this mean God is a harsh, judgmental, violent deity? Has that question ever come to your mind when you read this story? Now, we read just a portion of the scripture today. We read the early part where God calls Noah and then the end where God makes this covenant. But I really want us to remember the whole um, narrative, and so I want to kind of give you some of that. Uh, Noah appears on the scene uh, in Genesis, and right before he appears on the scene, we are told that the earth is filled with violence. Not that people are just being kind of mean to one another. The earth is filled with violence, and God was grieved in his heart, sorry that he had ever created human beings in the first place. Now remember back to God's original plan at creation? God created man and woman and placed them in the Garden of Eden, and they had everything they could ever want, except they were told 
not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now that's kind of like me telling you not to think of unicorns. And all you can think of is unicorns and whether unicorns were really on the ark or if the reasons there are no unicorns today is because Noah didn't like them and didn't put them on the ark and he left them to drown. But be telling you not to think about unicorns and there are no unicorns in the sanctuary and do not look over there on that drum set. There's not a unicorn on that drum set. Is anybody thinking of a unicorn on that drum set? Okay, come on. Somebody is. Yeah, you are. Don't picture them in that corner over there. Of course Adam and Eve are going to eat of that fruit. Of course they were, and God knew it would happen. I mean, did God really want a world of robots? I don't think so. Is anybody still thinking about that unicorn over there? Okay. God could have chosen not to put a tree in the garden, but I think God wanted to be in relationship with people who chose to be in that relationship. Kind of makes me think of a time when Matt and Chris were in preschool, and Chris hit Matt, supposedly, accidentally, I don't know. So I told Chris, now, Chris, you've got to tell Matt you're sorry. And he said, no. And so I gave him the look, you know, the mother look. And so finally he goes, I'm sorry. Boosh! Pushed him and goes running off. Didn't change a thing, did it? His words were empty. Chris wasn't Sorry. God didn't want empty words. God wanted our hearts to want to be in a relationship. So God gave us free will. We could choose that. So Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, and they knew immediately they'd done something wrong, so they hid from God. And before you know it, God escorts them out of the garden. And then the biblical story gets really messy. Almost immediately, we hear about Cain's uh, murder of his brother Abel. And then by the time we get to Noah, God is really unhappy. Now imagine being God and creating creatures, dust creatures in your very own image and breathing life into them and giving them free will with all the provisions for a wonderful life to live in this beautiful world that you've created and then seeing them disobey you and hide from you. God had such great expectations for his world and yet, what it, it wasn't happening. God's dreams were not being fulfilled. And God was sad. He had had it. And so he says, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I've created. Together with the animals and creeping things and birds of the air, I am sorry that I ever made them. Now, that sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? But then the most amazing thing happens. God notices Noah. God notices Noah and his family. And suddenly in the midst of this this bizarre story, we have this radical new idea emerging. God isn't an angry tyrant. God is a concerned, grieving parent who wants to find a way for people to live in a right relationship with him. We are told that Noah found favor in the sight of God. God just noticed Noah and he found favor. It doesn't tell us because Noah was doing something wonderful. It just says Noah found favor with God. And favor is really kind of like the Old Testament word for grace. Noah didn't earn it. There wasn't something he did to deserve it. God just found favor with Noah. And after... Noah found favor. Then we're told he was a righteous man and he walked with God. Noah was a friend of God. Well, for this new God concept to work that God had in mind, he needs Noah to do something. So he instructs him to build an ark, which he does. You have to wonder what his neighbors thought. Building this huge boat miles from any water. But he does it. And then Noah gets all the animals on board, and God shuts Noah in. Literally, the the Hebrew word means he tucks them in the ark. And the floods came for 40 days. And after 40 days, the rain stops, and the floods recede, 
and birds are dispatched. Finally, a dove is dispatched. She returns with an olive leaf, which is a biblical metaphor for renewal of life and peace on earth. And so Noah and his family and the whole menagerie of animals leave the ark to live on fresh land. And the very first thing Noah does is he builds an altar and makes a sacrifice to God. And it's then when we hear a promise from God. Scripture says that God says to his heart, I will never again curse the ground because humankind. The inclination of the human heart is evil from its youth, but I will never again destroy every living creature as I've done. God created us with free will and knew we would make bad decisions. He knew we would go against him and continue to make mistakes. Even though he had started all over again with this one family, he knew that it was going to continue. Yet God says, I won't destroy you again. You see, the flood really didn't change humankind. We still had that will to do wrong. We still thought we knew better than God and we were smarter. But God creates a covenant. And it's the first covenant in the Old Testament. It is a formal commitment by God to Noah and to his descendants, which means to you and me also. God will never again destroy all of humanity. And then the sign of that remarkable promise is, there's a sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It's a one-sided covenant. God's making the promises, and we have no responsibilities that we have to uphold for God to keep that covenant. It is a sign of pure, unmerited grace. The rainbow, which is actually an inverted weapon of war, is now a sign of God's promise to love and to care for every living creature for all generations. God made a way where there was no way. With what seemed impossible, God did something new, had a new plan, and made life in relationship with God possible. Now, did the flood make everything right? No. In fact, that what follows in the Old Testament is how God's covenant is tested again and again and again by generations of Israelites. In fact, Noah gets off the ark, plants a vineyard, gets really, really drunk, and then curses one of his sons and all the future generations of Ham. That doesn't sound like a very righteous person, does it? So even this wonderful person that God chose blows it. And then Abraham... God elects Abraham and his whole people, and he chooses his people to make a nation. Doesn't really make a difference. The liberation of Egypt, uh, liberation from Egypt by Moses, doesn't really make a difference. The giving of the law on Sinai, doesn't really make a difference. The selection of kings, no. The calling of prophets. Now, maybe some of those things made some difference. But people still wandered away from God, refused to do God's will, thought they were wiser and smarter than God, felt like they had no need for God, they were fine on their own, and continued to not be in relationship. And that continues until at great cost to God, a radically different possibility is revealed. God comes and lives among us in the person of Jesus Christ and gives his life so that nothing in life or in death can separate us from his love. Absolutely nothing. You see, once God opened that door at creation and gave us a choice of eating that tree, God knew we would make choices. Some of them not really very healthy choices. Choices would not only hurt other people, but would hurt ourselves. 
So God made a way to heal all of that. So can we trust a God who destroys creation? Well, maybe we need to realize that God found a way to save creation. God found a way in a very dark and violent situation. God offered a new beginning because of incredible love for humanity. You know, there are lots and lots of flood narratives in many, many cultures. But the Hebraic narrative, the Jewish Christian narrative is the only one where God says, I will never do this again. This is the one where God shows his amazing love for you and for me. As God says, I am making all things new. God continues to make things new when we blow it, when we do things that hurt ourselves and one another, or when we find ourselves in a very dark situation. You know, it may be the floodwaters of divorce papers or unemployment checks running out or a diagnosis from the doctor of terminal or family conflict. And life may seem impossible, and it may seem like there is violence of spirit all around and chaos. But God has given us so many promises, and God is not a God of chaos. In the beginning, he moved over the waters and brought order out of chaos. And he moved in our lives and brought order to our lives. God has given us promises, and God will not destroy us. God will not destroy our souls. Many of you know that J.T. Fields is critically, critically ill. He has been battling cancer for about a year and a couple of months now. And he's really, really weak, and he can't do much of anything. This past week when I was with him in the hospital one day, he said, you know, Nancy, every morning I talk to God and I say, God, I can do this one thing. Because physically, he cannot do more than one thing a day. He says, I say, God, I'll do this one thing, and I'm trusting you to do everything else. I'll do one thing and you do the rest. And it's interesting. uh, He said, now, Nancy, do you remember when I first became an elder and we had that training and we had to go around the room and talk about, you know, the gifts we bring? He said, I told y'all, I may bring a lot of gifts to this session, but the one thing I don't bring is evangelism. You are never going to find me out talking to somebody about my faith. And yet JT told me that day that just that day, they'd taken him two different times to have um, CT scans done and the person going, the person bringing him, and the person taking the scans, he told them all about his one thing and trusting God with the rest. He has told that to almost everybody at Seton Williamson that he has encountered. Friday, he had some surgery. They thought they were going in to drain some um, infection, and what they went, they found in just lots more tumors. And so the doctor came in and was talking to him. He said, you know, I'm not sure I've ever seen anybody with as much faith as you have. You see, cancer is not destroying JT. God is with him because God has promised him that he will be with him. And that there's nothing, not chemotherapy, not tumors, not fluid, not anything that is going to separate him from the love in Jesus Christ. And JT is trusting in God's promises. And he's not afraid, whatever may come. He's in an ark. The waters are pounding around him, and let me tell you, he doesn't smell very good in that ark. He's going through some tough stuff, but he's trusting in God's promises. Friends, you and I have a God who loves us so much that God will always find a way to be in relationship with us. But God is not going to force it. God allows us to choose. So I challenge you, open your heart. Just trust him. He'll take care of you. And there's nothing that will separate you from his love. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, you are so amazing. You created this amazing world just for us, and we just look at it like it's nothing. And you give us relationships of love, and and we, we do things to destroy that. 
And you come to us and you accept us even when we are just fools. God, thank you for loving us at our worst. Thank you for never destroying our very souls. Thank you for offering us the gift of life. Today, we come to you and we open you our hearts, God. Let us come into a relationship that is a living relationship with you. And may we learn to trust in your promises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.